Ladies and gentlemen, uh, welcome to Auspicious Day today. On behalf of Wilkinson Publishing, thank you all very much for being here. And uh, the basic formats we've got some remarks, and then we'll do some QA. &A. And then after that, we are really lucky. Mark will sign some books if you want some books. Uh, and then we'll sell as well. But without further ado, can I introduce the opinion editor for Danny Sobart, Dan Quarman? Um, as as uh, Max just said, I, I have the great privilege of being the opinion editor at the Daily Telegraph, which means I have the even greater privilege of editing Mark's columns every week. Um, the Daily Telegraph, as you well know, is a paper that is proud of being a voice for Sydney, for all of Sydney, not just certain fashionable suburbs or fashionable demographics. Those parts of town beyond what some people might call the latte curtain or the red rooster line, or whatever you might like to call it. Which is why it is such a natural home, I think, for, for Mark's columns to appear in the Daily Telegraph, and why it is so great today to be able to launch this book, which has so many of these great columns between two covers in one place for us all to go back and peruse and enjoy, and also marvel, I think, at some of the perspicacity uh, within within these pages, because on topic after topic, whether it's local issues, traffic and planning, and the impact of policies that often combine high levels of immigration with low levels of forethought, or that sort of thing, or national or international issues, Mark, time and time again, if you'll excuse the phrase, hits the mark. I was actually flipping through the book yesterday, and I was amused to revisit some of his columns, including one that he published on October 11th last year, and he wrote that everything's coming up trumps. Now, he was right, where almost the entirety of the Australian commentariat was wrong, including many so-called experts at our universities and other places that, uh, that are supposedly experts on American policy. And Mark's predictions about the insurgent nature of politics in the West, I think, continue to come true, and I haven't spoken with him about it, but I imagine that everything from the German elections to the recent events in Catalonia probably fit this pattern as well. But it's not all international power politics or enlightenment values with Mark, or the threats to the, these values that come from political correctness and elsewhere. At heart, Mark is really about Sydney, and this book is about Sydney, and, and not just inner Sydney, but all of Sydney, greater Sydney, western Sydney. These places where individuals and cultures jostle up against one another, bumping up against one another, and compete for space and opportunity. And often inadequate infrastructure, but they share the same dream of opportunity and an egalitarian enlightened Australia. These are the people who do the jobs and run the businesses that make our great metropolis home, and who Mark in so many ways represents with his columns every Tuesday in the Daily Telegraph. So on behalf of the Daily Telegraph, I'd like to congratulate Mark uh, on this book, on his fantastic work and his fantastic collection, but also congratulate him for being such a powerful and articulate voice for our community. So, thank you. Thank you, James, and thank you, Danny Telegraph. And uh, later on, would you welcome to launch the book officially outsiders and on retirement? Please welcome Australia's number one radio broadcaster. And star of Jones and Co. Alan Jones. Um, thank, thank you very much, uh, James and Mark. Um, you've just given me an opportunity to indicate why the program was, in the past tense, called Jones and Co. When um, when Richard got sick, there was all this debate at Sky as to who replacing and I said that I only wanted one person, Mark Latham. Well, they went out and And but this and but that. No, 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 I said, look, this is it. So as a result of the fact that they believed this rowing up there, you're looking so such or why why haven't I got one of those shirts? <laughs> but they were they were so convinced that Latham was so outrageous that he'd only last two programs at the most. They didn't call it Latham and Jones, they called it Jones and Co. So for months and months you were Co. Then I went into hospital and you didn't go mad. <laughs> you didn't, but they did. And then suddenly there was none of it. But nonetheless, this is, I'm not guilty of the lily here today. Firstly, Mark, I'm, I'm deeply honoured 
that, that you've asked me to launch the book. I make that comment with all sincerity. And in what I have to say, nothing I say today will be original because I've just dug into the book and I thought I'd take this opportunity to share some of what is quintessentially Latham. Oh, you're, poor. you're up early. <laughs> um, quintessentially Latham. Uh, we should welcome, I suppose, the ABC, who I'm sure are here in numbers, and uh, members of the Fairfax Press who get respectable and honourable mention in the book. But as I've said in the forward, there's no holding back. And we are at the point now where this man's time has arrived. No one speaks, no one, no one speaks more eloquently, more persuasively, and more powerfully for the outsiders in contemporary society than this man. <coughs> and he defines them. <coughs> Pardon me. In a forward that Andrew Bolt writes, Andrew says this, no wonder that to many of his readers or viewers of Mark Latham's Outsiders, his words are like rain in a desert, lightning in darkness. And it's also why so many in power, power maintained by spin and deceit, hate him and wish that extra venom produced by fear. Well, he defines the Outsiders in his own forward to the book, and he talks about them as people, citizens, he said, who can make up their own minds and set their own values and behave the way they see fit in a free society. Who are they? Well, he said they're elites versus every man. In geography, he says, inner city snobs versus down-to-earth practical people in the suburbs and the regions which he's inhabited and never walked away from and never been ashamed of where his roots are. He talks in his own forward about the cultural war that we're fighting, and there are so many of them here. Margaret Canine single-handedly has fought that cultural war. It's lovely to have you here today. You're one of the rare victors. It's been back in difficult times in the new Australia. He talks about the cultural war we fight, a struggle to defend, he says, and preserve the best of Western civilization. He talks about the identity left, wanting to wipe out the gains of the 17th century enlightenment, and he defines what those gains are. The creation of meritocracy. We're no longer appointed in contemporary society on the basis of merit. The creation of meritocracy. The universal application of free speech. People are just terrified to say what they feel and what they believe. The use of observable truths in guiding social progress. He said Australia has been too good a country to let the left wing win. We like it to have you. He says, the elites desperately think, you do make me laugh, I know everyone thinks that, that Marx is sort of really serious people all the time, ready to bash people up, you know. <laughs> and, but, but he isn't. His language can be very, very humorous. And often I don't think he understands exactly how funny he is. There's one piece early in the book where he says the, the elites desperately need therapeutic help. <laughs> he said, overdosing on a cocktail of soy lattes and anxiety pills they convince themselves that Australia is an inherently bigoted country. Normal people see no such thing. He talks with passion about Gough Whitlam, whom he succeeded in the seat of Werewolf. And many people, many Australians, acknowledged, and even in a postscript, Gough would have acknowledged his weaknesses. But as Mark said, Gough Whitlam, the great man of scholarship, dedicated his life, Mark's words, to the principles of the Age of Enlightenment. Mark Latham writing, that rational, evidence-based argument could create a better and a fairer society. Rational and evidence-based could create a better and fairer society. He said, not only is the post-structural agenda anti-reason, anti-science and anti-family, 
It's also anti-education. It wants to abandon the conventional process of learning through known facts and universally established truths, creating a borderless world of genderless individuals. Australia's political leaders, he said, are sleepwalking into an educational disaster. We can't afford to ignore this man and what he's written. This is a book that actually ought to be in every classroom in the country. And I really challenge you today to urge your friends and colleagues to read it. In fact, mark it as I've marked mine. This stuff is to be opened up and shared. And I wanted to share some of that with you today. He talks about the new trend at the ABC and the Fairfax media to judge people, not by the quality of their character or their contribution to society, and these are all his words, but by the colour of their skin and the shape of their genitals. He talks about identity politics, and he says this, quote, subdividing the community on the basis of race, gender and sexuality, building a resentment among groups ignored by the selective nature of identity favouritism. He justifies these views, and they're there. I mean, every annual report today now, it's got a gender equity chapter. Frightening. No woman wants to be promoted on the basis of her gender. No woman. And we're Australian women are women of impeccable merit and have been through the years. And yet, that has been changed. He says, how damaging is this identity politics? He doesn't miss the political parties either. Liberal, Labor and the Greens, he says, they fund the government's agencies which are culturally at war with suburban and regional Australia. That is undeniable. Undeniable. One man's dead, Bill Leake. Students have been sent broke in Queensland. It's the most disgraceful treatment. And here's a man, a passionate defender of these people. He said, this is what the current parliament is presiding over. Institutions, this is Mark Latham, that hector and harangue people, telling them it's wrong to love Australia Day, to wave the flag, to sing the anthem, to celebrate the virtues of our majority European heritage. Mark writes, Canberra can't stop feeding the beast of public spending and bureaucracy. He says a 49% top marginal tax rate that punishes economic success and leaves small business people and professional working everyday people to work every second day for the government. I mean, it does trip off the tongue, does it, 49 cents in the dollar tax. But that means people are working all January, all February, all March, all April, all May, all June before they get to keep a quit. This is not the Australia that people went to war to defend. And Mark has argued that powerfully. He says, and isn't this true? Well, it's true of me, and I'm sure it's true of a whole heap of people here in front of me. Mark says, barely a day goes by without someone stopping me on the street to say, Mark, what's happening to Australia? We've made people, he's quoting conversations to him, we've made people from all over the world welcome here, but now because of my skin colour and my sex, I'm being made to feel unwelcome. He says, instead of encouraging people to cross gender, racial and sexuality boundaries and find common cause with their fellow citizens, the left is encouraging separatism. He said, how can students get to know each other? This is Mark Latham. Magnificent mind, this man. And sits and researches and writes. This is not made up as he goes along. He said, how can students get to know each other and build trust across racial boundaries if white kids are kicked out of computer labs solely because of the colour of their skin? He says, an unholy alliance of Marxist academics and Liberal and Labour education ministers are running the Safe Schools program as a way of interfering in the sexuality of our children. He said, freedom of speech is under siege, as the elites, quote-unquote elites, use PC language control, 
social media hysteria, consumer boycotts, and defamation laws to silence opponents. Margaret Kinane is frowning. She understands what all of that means. He said, he doesn't miss any of the politicians either. Malcolm Turnbull is living in a world of delusion. He cites all the failures. And he said, by this inventory of outcomes, Turnbull is the most radically leftist and divisive Prime Minister in Australian history. As these massive changes swirl around him, Turnbull's become a bit player, the political equivalent of a cud-chewing cow watching the passing traffic. <laughs> but this is not a book, this is not a book which proclaims the weaknesses without recognising and prosecuting the solutions. He says to reclaim our country, we need parliamentarians willing to implement five key reforms. He said one, the smaller, less intrusive government, abolish the Human Rights Commission, SBS, and Marxist gender theory outfits like Our Watch. I think Lucy Turnbull is the chairman of Our Watch. Two, the ABC must be democratised, sidelining the leftist, incestuous employment cabal currently running it. Three, introduce laws that prohibit segregation in Australia, thereby abolishing abominations like safe spaces and non-white multicultural playgroups. Four, outlaw employment practices based on anything other than meritocracy. That is, get rid of identity quotas in the Australian workplace. Five, I can hear people in the suburbs cheering. Five, <coughs> refuse to fund universities and schools that base their coursework and teaching programs on neo-Marxism. This would end the anti-enlightenment push at sinkhole universities like La Trobe, Deakin and Western Sydney. He says, those are the five, but he says, post-structuralist Marxism is a bigger threat to Western civilization than the state Marxism of the 20th century. And he makes this very valid point. The old Soviet Union was a clearly defined and highly visible rival. Now, says Mark Latham, the enemy is within. He says, by every international comparison, Australia's education system has fallen apart over the past 20 years. We're now ranked below Kazakhstan, a national embarrassment. He said Australia already has record levels of school funding, and yet our academic results have gone backwards. He writes, the problem in education is not the amount of money being spent, but how the funds are being used. He says, Labor and the Liberals have found a convenient way of dealing with the crisis in our schools, pretend it's all about funding, and then tab up their largesse on the national credit card. He said, our government schools have become social laboratories for leftist gender theory and manipulating the minds of students, herding them into a so-called anxiety epidemic. I talk to one of these kids regularly. They confirm that when you convince them to be confident to tell me what they really think. They know this is going on. What can they do, they say. I'll be failed if I don't write what they want me to write. Mark says, while our politicians fiddle with the relative trivia of funding envelopes, we're consigning our children to a second-rate future by tolerating hopeless teachers and wacky coursework. But as James has made the point, this is not just about domestic Australia. On foreign policy, he quotes the former president and think where we are today on foreign policy. I mean, we've got to find a fight with someone. That's foreign policy. <coughs> and he quotes the former president, Bill Clinton, who once said of the defence hawks, quote, the problem in my country is we have powerful people who think that America always needs enemies. He makes the key point, if there were no military threats globally, there'd be no juicy defence contracts for American and Japanese interests. In foreign policy, Mark says, as with most aspects of bond policy, money talks. That's where we are right now. 59 people dead, 527 
at last count, injured, and 100 bills have become before the American Congress in the last five years. 100 all rejected to tighten up gun control because money talks. The National Rifle Association has <coughs> tremendous political influence. 7.7 .7 million Americans own between 8 and 120 guns. 7.7 .7 million. Okay, that people say, well, stop that. We've got to stop it by legislation. They can't get it through Congress. Mark writes, anyone watching US politics closely, and this is his, one of his favourite themes, but he was ahead of the pace, will have seen this soliloquy hundreds of times. This is in relation to Trump. Never have many, so many paid political experts been so wrong so often about a political candidate. See, this is the test of Latham's judgment. He was out of the box before anybody. I believed that the blue wall up in the north couldn't be breached, and Mark was on my program at the time. And I said, look, I understand what you're saying. I, I really think Donald Trump would shake the whole shot, but how does he breach the blue wall? Don't worry, he said. The Donald will get there. And people thought, well, this is the lunatic Latham being let loose. Being let loose. He said, the question remains. He writes, the question remains. Why has the Donald from day one provoked so much animosity? His foreign policy stance is actually said straight from the left playbook. Something they've been calling for since Vietnam to end America's role as a self-appointed global policeman, needlessly invading nations. So why did the left oppose him? But he said the more the media attack him, the more his supporters dig in to vote for him. And this says something, writes Mark Latham, the commentariat rarely acknowledge. In the information age, when people are better educated and more widely informed, the public is less trusting of big, concentrated centres of power, big government, big business, big unions, big media. And they're reacting. Look what's happened to Merkel in Germany. Worst results since World War II. And then we've seen the situation in Britain, we've seen it in America. It's going to happen here. Make no mistake about it. It'll happen in Queensland in a matter of months' time. Mark says that Donald is unbeholden, as is Mark Layton, to the conventional institutions and pressure groups of politics. His party, opposed to him, the media, the PC outrage industry, big business, and the foreign policy defence establishment. He makes significant comments about Abbott and Shorten. I've already indicated what he said about Turnbull. He said Abbott has his mojo back as a policy advocate. He's speaking for the fed up, silent majority, the Aussie larrikins and the battlers in the outer suburbs and regions who don't have a megaphone in hand at the ABC, the Project or Fairfax Media to advance their agenda. All they have is their vote. And currently, Mark Latham says, it's parked with Pauline Hanson, virtually by default. Mark says, love him or hate him. Abbott is right. We need a bold new policy direction for Australia's future. Mark says, in theory, 2017, this should be a golden age of freedom as self-reliant citizens go about their business without the hectoring presence of big government and identity politics. Yet, he said the opposite is true. He writes, the elites, mainly from the left, have misused their institutional power. Everywhere we look in the education system and the media, social and mainstream, so-called progressives are advancing their agenda for open borders, ethnic nihilism, language control, segregationist safe spaces and gender indoctrination programs such as safe schools and respectful relationships. He says these are relatively recent issues placed on the public agenda not because society has changed for the worse but because the left wants each of us to change, to live our lives in their image. This is Latham. For the first time Western nations are being subjected to widespread social engineering, much of it publicly funded. He talks about Bill Shorten. The Shorten pivot has been one of the most striking developments in the ALP's 125-year history, but not in a good way. 
Labor is now a party of leftist orthodoxy, wedded to the twin failures of retro economics and identity separatism. He says, Shorten has embraced the fairy dust doctrine of inclusive prosperity. Elsewhere he says he thought that was a horse that was a star in the second race of Bloomberg, <laughs> inclusive prosperity, like as a defined compliment. <laughs> Uh, in Shorten has embraced the fairy dust doctrine of inclusive prosperity, a belief that debt-funded spending on health, welfare and social workers can create a, quote, sustainable pathway to economic growth. He said if inclusive prosperity... Oh, this is where... Sorry, I'm, I'm going to get ahead of myself. This is where you say it. If inclusive prosperity, he says, because he's a mad racing man, were a horse, it would be racing under the name of fine cotton. <laughs> a comical... Mark's words, a comical ring-in from a stable that should have known better, having produced the stakes-winning hawk Keating economic pedigree. He says, Labor's identity separatism runs counter to the community-building principles of social democracy. Marx says, subdividing the nation on the basis of race, sexuality and gender is a formula for social decay, weakening our united purpose and common ideals as citizens. He says, our society and its values, and I'll end here, this is the guts of the book, our society and its values are under threat from the two extreme ends of politics, the new fascism of radical Islam and the new socialism of post-structuralist education and PC thought policing. He says both movements are frightfully authoritarian, pushing back against pluralism and the principles of the Age of Enlightenment. They are, he says, marvellous language, the many evil grave diggers of our civilization. Brilliant. The many evil grave diggers. We are at risk. Make no mistake about it. Marx says, in answering this threat, social conservatives and social democrats now have more in common than they could ever have imagined. He says, we are fighting for freedom and the survival of civilization. Sadly, as two timid, politically correct leaders, Turnbull and Shorten are not part of that fight. This man's leading it. Would you please welcome the author of these challenging observations, Mr Mark Latham. and thanks everyone for coming along. The first thing I've got to do is answer a question that's already been put to me. Why are we at the Intercontinental, not normally my part of town? Well, we tried to book the Trump Tower, but unfortunately Cynthia hasn't got one, so we thought, in honour of the spirit of the Donald, this would be the next closest thing. Uh, I particularly want to thank uh, James and Alan for their introduction and endorsement of the book. They're some of the best speeches I've ever heard, uh, quite frankly, and, and I can't uh, find a word wrong with Alan's summary of the content of the book, so I want to concentrate uh, my comments on the commercial side of things, and uh, Michael Wilkinson, the publisher, I thank him, but also there's a note of concern as to our prospects. Can we sell any copies? Because we're up against mammoth competition from two of the great political giants of literature in this country. Just yesterday, Gareth Evans launched his book <laughs> at the National Press Club. A full comprehensive memoir of his time in politics. And it struck me in hearing about it, it has something very, very important in common with my book. And that is neither volume has a single word about an affair with Cheryl Kernow. <laughs> Importantly, in my case, because I never had one. <laughs> but there's a bigger threat, ladies and gentlemen, a bigger threat looms on the horizon. Two words, Kevin Rudd. <laughs> Kevin Rudd is launching his memoirs, not in one volume, but two. <laughs> it's a case of when Kevin talking about himself is never enough. 
he's gone on to a second volume, as you'd expect the great Kevin to do. Now what can we do against that kind of competition? Kevin Rudd talking about himself. It's just impossible, isn't it? It reminds me of the old story we had in the Labor caucus that you'd be walking down the corridors and Kevin would have some hapless backbencher bailed up in the corner. You'd go by and you'd ear wig in and then you'd hear Kevin say, well, that's enough from me. What do you think about me? <laughs> that was the nature of every conversation Kevin ever had. And with the release of his memoirs, first volume, to be followed by the second, words out that Kevin's on the comeback trail. He barnstorming through his old South Brisbane electorate, visiting schools, shopping centres, community centres. He was at a nursing home the other day, and I'm reliably told that he was uh, going up and down the corridor, shaking all the hands, big noting himself as only Kevin can. And one of the little old ladies there walked up and said, uh, who are you? Well, you can imagine how quick he's eager. Imagine saying that to Kevin Wright, who are you? And he started to get upset about it, saying, who am I? Who am I? And this noise is bellowing down the corridors of this nursing home. Who am I? It was becoming quite a scene. And then another little old duck came up and said, excuse me, if you don't know who you are, you go to the front desk and they tell you. The other great mystery about Kevin's book, and it's one where he's handicapped at the moment, I'm worried about competition from him, but he's got a major concern on his hands. Laurie Oates is retired, who can he leave it to? <laughs> the whole point of Kevin writing the book is that no one actually has to go and buy it and spend the 50 or 60 dollars, it all would have been in a Laurie Oates exclusive. Well, <laughs> Laurie's uh, retired to that great ice cream shop in the sky, uh, out, of, out of journalism. <laughs> The what? Story? Leaking story. Oh, the leaking story. Oh, well, we can, we can, we can go into the leaking <laughs> story where uh, Paul Murray reminded me the other day that uh, probably my greatest appearance on his uh, show was um, at the time of the 2010 election campaign. And it's a great mystery. I mean, you know, the press gallery, they're always befuddled by what's going on. Laurie Oakes had these exclusive leaks from a meeting that involved Kevin Rudd, Julia Gillard and John Faulkner. Now, John Faulkner would never tell his mother what was going on, so it wasn't him. <laughs> Julia Gillard, the leaks were against her, so obviously it couldn't be Julia Gillard who's leaked this out to, to, to Laurie Oakes in the 2010 election campaign. But still, the press gallery was befuddled. Who could it be? Where did they come from? We never reveal our sources. Who could it possibly be? Well, I got on Paul's show and said, well, this is just one of the basic laws of nature, that when you're here, you're lying in bed at night and you hear the pit of pat of sound on your roof, you don't have to go out and see that it's raining. So too, when Laurie Oakes has got these massive leaks from a meeting involving Kevin Rudd, you don't have to have been on the phone to get the conversation that it was given to. You know automatically it was Kevin Rudd, and so too it came to pass. But as Alan's pointed out, this was uh, predicted. Uh, this was a prophecy in the Latham Diaries uh, as to Rudd's uh, leaking capacity, because when I was leader of the Labor Party in 2004, Gillard and others would always say, we've had this strategy meeting, Oakes has got the material, who do you think's giving it to him? Oh, well, it's Kevin. And then finally I had enough of this. So I said to Kevin, look, there's a Labor polling here, uh, under wraps, but I'm going to tell you, because you're the uh, shadow foreign minister, that most Australians are very, very supportive of the um, uh, alliance with the United States, very supportive of the US Security Alliance, and uh, they've got some concerns about the policy we've got on Iraq. So Kevin's always lined up. And you can automatically tell this uh, polling, which didn't exist, I made it up to, to set it up. <laughs> I said that little Tim, uh, little Tim Gartrell, um, who's gone on to bigger things now, running the campaign for same sex marriage. He was running the Labor Party campaign then. And uh, hopefully they'll have the same fate as uh, in 2004. But I said to Tim, don't, you know, Kevin will come to you and say, is it true we've got this polling? Tell Kevin that uh, it's true. And I predict within a fortnight it'll be in Laurie Oaks column in the bulletin. And as certain as those raindrops on your roof, it was. Um, you can be absolutely guaranteed. So it, it, the question's open. Laurie Oates has gone to the great uh, journalistic um, resting place in the, in, in, in the Central Coast, I think it is. And who will he lead to? Well, my best guess is that Kevin will have to give his book to his press secretary, Peter Archer, who hasn't had a good lead for uh, well, since, since, since Kevin retired from politics. And, and if that's not possible, he'll give it to his assistant press secretary, Troy Branston. And I noticed that neither Peter nor Troy are here today. Uh, I wonder why. I wonder why they're off elsewhere getting the information. 
from Kevin's work. So that's the competition we face in, in launching this volume. It's, it's ferocious competition from these literary giants. And I'm worried, can we sell any copies? But in terms of the content, hopefully it will sell, not because it's a, it's a memoir or it's me talking about myself, but for all the reasons Alan outlined about the threat to our civilization, the threat to our culture, the threat to our democracy that comes from this new era of identity politics and political correctness. And I've got to say, uh, having cut my teeth from a social democratic Labor Party background, on a serious note, it is the great despair of my life that anyone would think that you create a better society by dividing people from each other, that you engage in divisive identity politics, that you start to judge people not by their individual quality or their work ethic or their community and family values, you judge them by their race, gender and sexuality. It is just so incredibly divisive to push Australians apart in this fashion and pretend from a centre-left perspective, that it's somehow progressive. I mean, this is an absolute betrayal of progressive ideals. Identity politics is a complete betrayal of social democracy. And fortunately, I'm not the only one saying it. Peter Baldwin, who was the intellectual leader of the Labor left faction, you know, at least to my credit, I was in the right faction fighting the left on issues when I was in the parliament. Peter was the intellectual leader of the Labor left. And he today says identity politics is a betrayal of social democracy, and in fact traditional social democrats, conservatives and libertarians need to unite in an alliance to defend civilisation, defend the enlightenment, defend the values of free speech and learning and knowledge and reason, and we should have a new form of politics, not so much insiders versus outsiders, but those who believe in the enlightenment values of the 17th century versus those, the medieval grave diggers who want to take us back to a time when society wasn't fair when in the mid medieval period you had to be the son of a feudal lord to get ahead. And today the left are replicating medieval superstitions like unconscious bias. Where did that crap come from? <laughs> Seriously. Who thinks for a moment people have got voices in their head <coughs> saying, I can't employ that woman, I can't employ that indigenous person, I can't employ that person from, uh, uh, from Asia because I'm a, I'm a white, white male. Well, they tested this proposition recently in the federal public service and found that discrimination wasn't against any of those groups, that it was against the white Anglo-Saxon men. And in fact, the white men were going out of their way to employ people other than those who looked like them. And it turned out the only voice in the head was that of Martin Parkinson. What Ross and Rowland described as Parkinson's disease. <laughs> well, I can't say that, they said it. Um, that he's got the voices in his head, thinking this medieval superstition of unconscious bias is valid. Now, who's Martin Parkinson? He's the head of the Australian Public Service. He's Malcolm Turnbull's head of the Prime Minister's Department. He's not some pen pusher down the back of the Immigration Department signing a form. He's the head of the whole show, and he believes in this rubbish. So the whole system, from top to bottom, has lost its ballast, its reason, its judgment about these issues. And, I want to, and, and Alan mentioned about the, the people who come up to me and, and say, what the hell's going on with our country? It's a fascinating process because about 18 months ago, I noticed when you spoke to people on the street, they sort of had this curiosity that PC is coming back. What, what's going on? But it was just a curiosity. But today, people have worked out that there's a PC atrocity every day. There's a new source of division and segregation in our society every day. And they've seen the pattern and their curi curiosity has turned into alarm about what's happening to their country. And I'll give you today's one. Uh, fresh off uh, uh, my email system, the Deakin University on the 26th of this month is running a conference called On Anti-Racism. On Anti-Racism. And they brought over a guy called Dr Amir Jamar, who's an assistant professor of philosophy from Texas University. So given he's coming here to a conference at an Australian university, I assume everyone in the room and beyond is funding this as taxpayers, this will be taxpayer funded, as Dr. Amir Jamar comes here, you wouldn't feed this way because he's going to speak on the subject of don't talk to white people. That's his solution to racism in any part of the world. Don't talk to white people. He says white people are so ignorant and their racism is so entrenched that what you need to do is not waste your time and breath in talking to them. And I quote from his little blurb on the conference uh, publicity, I propose that we stop talking to white people, or as I describe them, those who think of themselves as white. <laughs> what sort of 
This is straight from the Middle Ages, this stuff. This is the modern equivalent of witchcraft, where you say, I propose that we stop talking to white people, or as I describe them, those who think of themselves as white. Like, it's up for grabs, your skin colour. You know, maybe I'm black, maybe I'm red, maybe I'm yellow. I think of myself as white because I had white parents. I don't know, it happened in nature. Nature's uh, result was that I was born with a white skin. Not that I think that's important, or anyone else's skin colour is important. But we're paying as taxpayers in one of our public institutions, Deakin University, along with La Trobe, it's one of the centres of post-structuralist Marxism in Australia, for a guy to come out here and tell us, don't talk to white people, that's the best solution to racism. Now, all that does is segregate society. This is as bad as the old South Africa, isn't it? Where you segregate people away from each other, not because you can tell that they're bad people or they're dumb people or they, they are ignorant people, but simply because of their skin colour. This is just appalling for this to be happening in a public institution. So day after day after day, the politics of segregation and separatism takes hold. And it's being pushed completely as a paradox by those who say they're progressive. What's progressive in saying people shouldn't talk to each other? I grew up in a political environment through local government and then in my federal constituency in South West Sydney, where I thought the whole purpose of the better society was bring people together, they can share their values, share common purpose, work together in collective institutions to build a better, more caring society. If you'd said to me when I joined the Australian Labor Party out there at Green Valley in 1979, the whole objective of this show is to walk around saying that you shouldn't talk to white people. I, well, I would have locked you up. You know, we would have called out the straitjackers to lock you up. This is just insanity. That this is what leftism in Australia has become. So, Alan, it is what we fight against. Uh, it is what we fight against. And Peter Baldwin is fundamentally correct in saying that conservatives like you, libertarians like uh, David Lionhelm and, and others uh, in the room, and people from a social democratic background such as myself, who've now embraced the libertarian cause, we all need to form an alliance because essentially we're fighting for our civilisation and for a better society where we do talk to each other, where we share things, where we do the good old Australian practice of treating people on merit and giving them jobs and promotions based on nothing more than their ability. So we're fighting for a lot here. Uh, I write in the introduction of the book, well, how did I get re-interested in politics? Because while I was in the media post-2005, uh, I wasn't all that uh, animated or excited about a role in following Australian politics, quite frankly, as the father of three children. I fight the fight because I want them to have the proper, decent country I know of as their future, as their civilization, as their value. You know, potentially, we'll all be long gone while the worst of this is still playing out. So we fight for the next generation, and for that purpose alone, I dedicate this book, and thank you for coming along. Thank you, Mark. Ladies and gentlemen, if there's any questions, if we ask Mr. Latham, Mr. Jones, Mark, please, yes. Mark, you mentioned a few minutes ago that social democrats and libertarians need to join together to produce better political outcomes. Was that part of the, was that part of your decision-making process in joining the liberal democrats? Well, I've gained an appreciation of freedom in recent times, most notably because Rainbow Labor banned me from speaking at a Labor Party function <laughs> at Smithfield earlier this year. Now, Rainbow Labor would need a tracking device and a pitch up their gay Mardi Gras flag to even find Smithfield. <laughs> but, uh, you know, I, I, I first visited that club at Smithfield uh, in the early 1980s as a young man chasing a bit of skirt <laughs> in those days. So the idea that all these years later I was to be banned from speaking at Smithfield RSL to a bunch of Labor Party supporters by Rainbow Labor was just so outrageous. It was a forerunner to the repression that you see in this same-sex marriage debate, where the no case, you know, I mentioned an atrocity per day. The one today, of course, is they can't find a place to have their event in Hobart. Uh, they've been locked out of the casino where the university won't host an event for a group participating in a democratic debate in Australia. Um, so the repression of free speech marches on, but um, I appreciate the Liberal Democrats as a party of freedom. But it gets to the point where you can't speak in your own region where you've lived for more than 50 years as a former Labor Party leader, which are banned by Rainbow Labor, well it's time to look elsewhere and 
the Liberal Democrats have a diversity of opinion about various issues, that's healthy, but it's seen as healthy and an expression of free speech. So I love the idea of a party of freedom. And as I wrote up about David Leinhelm's book, published again by Wilkinson Publishing, and I'm launching it on Tuesday, as I wrote up in the, uh, the Telegraph uh, two days ago, it's a wonderful manifesto of free thinking ideas and encouraging debate beyond the echo chamber that we currently have in, in politics. So I love all that, and it reminds me in many respects of what the Labor Party used to be, not so much the content, but the freedom. The freedom to debate these ideas in an open, constructive way and not be thrown out of the room or banned from a function or the microphone pulled out just because you've got a point of disagreement. People back then would listen to disagreement, stand up and say, no, it's wrong for various reasons. I mean, that was debate. We don't have that debate now. So a party of freedom has a lot of virtue in that respect. They're happy to have you at Bellevue Hill and Rose, aren't they? Well, I get invitations everywhere these days, don't you? <laughs> <laughs> Bellevue Hill, who's the member for Bellevue Hill? Well, they were in revolt against the Well, they'll back any time. Yeah, well, right. Ian Ross blew them out of the park. That was great. Right. Questions? Um, we need to stop paying these people. Can't we start by like, privatising education, privatising universities, and make them stand on their own two feet? Then they'd have to do the right thing. They couldn't get away with all this crap. Well, how about we have a education minister in Canberra who says that if you're preaching separatism and segregation in your university, you'd be funded. That's the way to deal with Dr. Amir Jamar. That's the sanction. The yes. you know, if, we, if, we, if we heard about this happening in South Africa, a, rever a reverse of this, don't talk to black people. If we heard of this in South Africa in the 1970s, we would have said, well, an answer there is don't fund South Africa, which was Australia did with boycotting. Why are we funding it internally? It's just as racist, it's just as segregationist, and it's, it's just as plain wrong as it was back then. Why are we funding it internally? But I'll give you this guarantee. That, that weak sold Simon Birmingham will barely say a word, if anything. You know, that's the sad thing about all these atrocities day by day is that you know that the, the cone of silence, the cricket sound out of camera, will be universal in, in saying anything decent and standing up to this wrongness. That's the problem. So there's your answer, but I'm afraid you won't hear it from the power of half ministers uh, in the current government. Yes, thank you. Sophie York, Mark Latham, that was a great speech. Thank you. I thought you might like to know about the most recent example at New South Wales University where the students were asked to not refer to Hall's marriage theorem. They, they, they worked through a, um, a, a maths um, solution where, whereby they learned about the subset of coupling and, and, and so forth. And they used the example of husband and wife or men and women in that. And that, they were told that that was offensive and that they should not refer to it as um, Hall's marriage theorem. Well, that's everywhere as well. I cited an example on my show last night, Mark Latham's Outsiders, you need to watch it on YouTube, of documents that were sent to me out of Uniting Care Life Assist in Victoria, Uniting Care being the welfare arm of the Uniting Church. They've got an LGBTI staff group within the organisation who sent out a directive of certain words that shouldn't be used when speaking to elderly Australians looking for their care packages. They were terribly offensive words that would spin anyone out like wife, husband, son, <laughs> daughter, niece, nephew, because they're all gendered words, and you needed to degender all your language at Uniting Care Life Assist. I mean, if you're an elderly Australian, you're into your 80s and you're ringing up to get a care package, and all those worries about your loss of independence and your life's future, do you need these PC police telling you that it's wrong to say wife, husband, son, daughter, niece, nephew, even a phrase like lifestyle choice apparently was ruled out. I mean, it's, it's something straight out of the 1930s, isn't it? From Stalin or, or, or Germany. That we've got this level of language policing trying to control people. A lot of this is said in the name of diversity. There's not a single thing diverse about it. They're after a homogenous society where we all speak the same, think the same, have the same values. But it's, it's everywhere, this attempt to control our language uh, at um, life assist in Victoria for the sake of the 0.1% of the population that might be thought of as transgender. And, and, and the rights and comfort of the 99.9% .9 majority is totally white, staff directly. But within the United Church, why would you have an LGBTI staff group that gets the boss the others around? Well, they run this as a commune. You know, it's like a hippie commune. Everyone's got a little staff group based on their skin colour or sexuality. It's so divisive inside the organisation and so upsetting for the function they perform. But this is now becoming commonplace. I mean, uh, 
I said, well, the other day on the wireless that um, people say, how far is all this gone? I think it's 80%, 80% through our institutions now, and the rest of us, the 20%, we're the resistance to it. We're the minority. You know, where's our rights? We're the minority, and we're resisting it as best we can, but the problem is becoming so widespread, it's absolutely frightening. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, Mark, uh, just a question on the property, social property of resilience. Uh, there's a brilliant series on the ABC at the moment called Home Fires and set in the, in the town outside of London during the war and the Germans coming across bombing and the dynamics of life and love within the village. And the real thing is the, the tragedy of news coming back. But there's an extraordinary portrayal of resilience amongst the people who, who live and work together. Um, I agree much of what you're talking about is resilience of the social property today is something that is being diminished. Yeah, well, Alan's saying it's in the book. It's in the book because of my, my children and experience initially in public education, but that's so bad we've had to find to find schools that actually have testing and rigour. I mean, resilience has got to start in the education system. You get knocked down, you get up again. You fail a test, you work harder, you pass it next time. And that's not being taught in the schools. And again, in terms of bad values out there that are raised on a regular basis, the, the jihad against NAPLAN is part of that. The idea that you can't have testing in schools because it's upsetting the children is anti-education, it's anti-knowledge, it's anti-resilience. And I've ended up putting um, my 10-year-old uh, daughter, who's by far the brightest person in the family, in a school where they start every day with tests, a maths quick, quick quiz, and then a spelling test. And she's been doing this since the beginning of year three um, at that school. And by the time they got to NAPLAN later in the year, she came home and said, well, you know, Dad, what's all this NAPLAN about? I was like, just another test. I said, oh, yeah, we do tests every day. We do tests every day. So when she finished the NAPLAN, she came home and said, how was it? She said, oh, it was great fun, great fun. I did the test. And imagine, imagine, I'm competing against all the kids in Australia. I'm going to find out my level against all of them. Isn't that just great? So she was school on a testing culture and love the test. When you hear that Jihad did and, did and others in the, in, the, in the teachers union, of course, who run these people, saying that uh, the tests are upsetting and they cause anxiety, it's because the kids have never had a test before they got to NAPLAN. They're nervous on the first day of NAPLAN because it's the first test they've ever done in the education system. Why wouldn't they be worried? So you don't build resilience by thinking that you're not testing children in the education system and, of course, the absence of tests is complemented by the uh, wellness agenda. That uh, instead of teaching math, science, and English, a lot of these courses about mental wellness, which is having caused the anxiety problem about testing, they have to run the courses to fix the pick up the wellness. So you can see the, the vicious cycle we've got ourselves into, and the, it's all part of the reason why we can't even beat Borat's Kazakhstan in the international rankings. It's just wrong at every level. Just on that point that you made, I'm just quoting from Mark's book. He says, in the leftist laboratories, <coughs> formerly known as government schools, the teaching of fragility is given higher priority than the values of resilience and toughness in life. So the, he addresses that issue in the book very significantly. No, it's a snowflake culture that's not only in our universities, it's, it's now into our schools. And um, you just want, you know, write something soon about how the next generation is not without hope. There's a lot of hope there, but you worry about the stuff that's going on for sure. Last question. Mark, uh, where do you see it? Where do you see it going? You can talk here, in your speech, it's brilliant, book and everything. How do you get it mainstreamed? How do you get it into the heads of the political class? With their pretty hopeless idea. How do you replace them? Who the hell do you vote for? <laughs> well, hopefully the alliance of people fighting Against this stuff can be formed at some stage, that would be useful. Um, but maybe there's another process at, at play, and I don't exactly know how this happens, but the only historical precedent for this is the old Soviet Union, where there was a social experiment all about control, and it was control of the means of production. And the idea was counter to human nature. If you pay everyone the same amount of money, they'll still work hard. And it fell over because it was trying to defeat human nature. A political theory from the left traditional Marxism, fell over because it was trying to conquer human nature. And I've got to believe 
that in politics and society you won't beat human nature. In the end, human nature will push through. And that's why the Soviet Union fell out. And our lasting hope in this battle is that the left are making the same mistake. They're not trying to control the means of production, they're trying to control language, values, culture, beliefs. But again, people in human nature want to have their say. They want freedom of speech. People in human nature believe in merit. They believe in judging people as they find them. That's always the Australian way we call it the fair go. Australians believe in meritocracy. It's part of our nature. It's part of our DNA. So ultimately, I think the leftist project of control will fall over because they're trying to defeat human nature and in the end they'll lose. How that happens and plays out, I can't say, just as we wouldn't have predicted the fall of the Berlin Wall. But um, these Mongols won't win, I can guarantee you. Ladies and gentlemen, that's a wrap for us, but it's uh, Mark. We'll be here if you want to have a chat with him afterwards and to sign some books. We've got books on self and Wilkinson Hodgkin on the tank. Alan Jones, thank you, Alan. Thank you. Thank you.